of the chair and vice chair for 2020 there's a predetermined order in which the chairmanship is assigned on the planning commission and on the, as it turns out the board supervisor and uh, this is the meeting of the year when we make that change so I would like to uh, welcome Commissioner Frazier to the chair as the incoming chairman and he will take over at this point and run the rest of the meeting so Chairman Frazier. Okay, Good I guess, uh, that should be Diana. Walk on board. Item number two on tonight's agenda, approval of minutes from November 14th, 2019. I have one change. Uh, page three, second line, second word from the end. Pretty extreme environment. It should be required. No. Okay. Under that change, I'll make a motion to approve the I will second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 I am staying on this one. <coughs> okay. Moving on to agenda item number three. Tentative parcel map P-18-21, an application requesting to divide an approximate 13-acre parcel into two resulting parcels of approximately 5 and 8 acres for residential use. The project site is 541 Browns Ranch Road, Weaverville, APN number 024-410-02. Staff. Um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I will, as last time, recuse myself from this agenda item. Yeah. Thank you. Staff. Yes, this is a continued item from the November meeting. Um, a question um, was raised. Um, about condition number 12 regarding the culvert. Um, Conditioning the culvert for um, certain impacts from the resulting parcel of the subdivision map. Um, so, um, unless needed, uh, I won't go into the background of the map. And um, if we could, unless there's any questions, just go into the discussion about the conditions. Um, also, um, a correspondence was received from the applicant's representative regarding the desire to also. Uh, remove conditions number 13 uh, and 11 and 13, 11 and 13 in addition to either modifying or removing condition number 12. Did you receive that letter yeah. and can you review it? Okay, we do have Department of Transportation staff present and I do believe the applicant, um, proponent of the project has prepared um, some maps and um, some, some comments regarding the project and the request. Okay, so um, I guess before we open to public comment, we could, we'll open it up to the applicant and to DOT, um, hear from them, and then we'll open it up to the public. I'm Tom Dorfinghouse, I'm the applicant. 
and my representative from Kearney Valley Consulting Engineers has an opening statement he'd like to make. Just because he's the one that actually okay. prepared and submitted the documentation you have in front of you. Eric? Good evening. My name is Eric. I work with Trinity Valley Engineers. Um, we're here today to represent Tom and Patty Dorkinghouse. Uh, we'd like to work together to resolve these issues that we have. We feel um, I'm obligated to do this for Tom. In your staff report, we agreed to, you'll, you'll see the memo that we wrote, we agreed to all 17 conditions except 10, 11, 12, and 13, um, either all or portions of them. Um, if you have any questions about that memo, you can ask me at the end. Um, our intent is not to override the Subdivision Map Act or County Ordinances. With every project, there's limitations, physical constraints, financial burdens, in developing properties. It's our duty to ensure the balance is struck to meet these challenges. CDCE strives to serve all our clients in a timely manner. I'd like to point out that this application for the project was submitted back in 2018. It took more than 12 months to receive the conditions of approval on the project. And we feel this delay has added strain to the client and the project. And we'd also like to point out that historically, a subdivision review committee would have eased this process. Um, but in its absence, we find ourselves nearly 18 months into the process. We'd also like to take this time to bring to light a very important observation. We've noticed a steady decline in recorded surveys maps in the past decade. The decline has reached the lowest possible point with zero maps being recorded last year, and only one in 2018. Prior to that, maps were re being recorded on a frequent basis. So pretty much all subdivisions have ceased in this county. Um, I'd like to take it take this time to thank you for your considerations, and let me know if you have any questions on that memo you received. Any questions for Cole Fulton? Thank you.
actually say that they do not require easements on any neighbor's parcel. So it's a partial land grab. It doesn't do any good whatsoever. Unless they go a lot further than this by doing an eminent domain on the neighbor's parcel or neighbor account, but they say they don't have to. Okay. On to condition number 11. They're asking for us to redo this map and to show where we would like to have on the map a deed or actually an encroachment. Whereas, in other words, we're going to place a driveway to give the property that says a deed development plan to be put The reason behind they want behind this is that they say they have numerous people in the county that put in illegal encroachments without permits and such, so they want they don't like rate and temperature uh, citations. So therefore, they don't have to having the right citation. They think that by putting some crosshatch on this map is going to prevent them from having to do so. My position is that if and when this property is ever developed and they want to put a home on it, they're going to have to apply for it and get an inclusion for it. They have to be approved by the county. That's the time to do it. Doing it now, it could be changed. I mean, they might want to put it way in down here and have a long road to their home. It's not up here where I would put it. But my opinion doesn't matter. I might not be the one developing the property. <clears throat> Number 12 is a very contentious issue. They're asking me to spend four or five thousand dollars for an engineer to do a hundred year flood study to determine if the 30th culvert right here, the little brown right here, is of sufficient size to handle a hundred year flood and or any additional water drainage off of anything that comes down here. We have over 300 acres back up here, 100, 275 over feet of state land that drains right down this gulch. There are numerous parcels all the way up through here, including two that are vacant residential parcels, one 14 acres, one 15 acres, that are possibly going to be developed. If this parcel was to have a net zero drainage to it, that means those parcels up there also have to have an extra drain. But we're saying that this culvert is insufficient enough to handle one more drop of water. It's a late drain. So therefore, the wording that we worked back and forth with the Department of Transportation to try to get them to remove is, and they're reluctant to do so, they want to keep it in the wording of their condition, is that <clears throat> if there is anything other than a net zero application to the development of the property that it's possible we are doing this property development would have to put in a code. I called Post Court Construction as their engineering department if they could give me an idea of what it would cost to replace this 30 inch culvert with a 48 inch culvert. They said without any plans drawn, they can only give me just a thumbnail sketch. It was between $100,000 to $150,000 to replace the 30 inch cover with a 40 inch cover. And that's not even if, if that's only in the existing condition that the 30 inch cover is. If they have to do it according to state standards and they stay new construction within the 50 foot easement that exists, it could go up to $200,000 out of the real property is to replace this cover because you've got to put in the concrete floor, you've got to put in the stainless steel railings and stuff to stop people from falling off the cover uh, and then the ditch itself. So the standards in doing so would be extremely expensive <coughs> for anybody. So that's why we want to get the potential of that being a landowner uh, approval by the landowner's uh, condition <coughs> For replacement, if one we want that work replacement to move out of that condition. The, uh, the potential litigations, as they call it for, for doing this, is a, another open can of worms, simply because all the surrounding counties have adopted a, what is called a low impact development standard. Trinity County has not. There are no standards. So whatever mitigation you come up with is that the pure determination of whoever is in charge at the Department of Transportation or whether it's an acceptable mitigation or not. 
if they determine it's not an acceptable communication, the way they've written the wording in the conditions, is that then it would be up for draft as to who had to pay for it to do cost. That's the kind of thing I'm trying to get away from. Um, the cost of it is way different. The, the, and we'll go on to condition number 13, which is the stair of Travis Spring Road, that they're asking for us to dedicate a portion of property along the subject property on just this one side so that in the eventuality that they ever want to develop property on the upper end on the north side of this, there's only two parcels that have already have a road right away on this easement. It's currently a private easement all the way through that affects four existing parcels and possibly two more. So six parcels have the right to use this road. And if I dedicate a portion of mine, and they're saying that I do not need, they don't need a dedication from any of these other people, but they want to have me dedicate this, and what that does by dedicating it, even if they do not accept the dedication from me, by my dedication, my disproportion of it, it allows it to become a public room, which is going to greatly impact all of my neighbors are all going to be involved in this when it becomes a public road. So I think it's there again a ridiculous requirement on just being able to split into two parcels within the current standards of the area by paper minimums. That's all I'm asking you to do, split into two parcels. So I think that. Gerald has some words he wanted to bring up regarding the properties back here. And the, the, the wording in Condition 13 was either the ease of future development of the 275 acres that is now state land that they would need to be able to put a public road of Shasta Springs to be able to develop that. The likelihood from Less than 100 your question. Carol? <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Department of Transportation, would you like to speak? temporary uh, conditions uh, are in the code, uh, so a lot of them we uh, don't have discretionary decision making over. It says to ward a 60 foot, or to secure a 60 foot right away for uh, our roadways, so when it says it in the code, that's what we have to follow. As far as uh, 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 assessing the 100 year floodplain that's required on a lot of properties to identify so you don't build in the 100 year floodplain. And then also um, to keep, uh, keeping your flow on the property, the new uh, flow, um, taking that back to uh, pre project equals post project. To use that is a very contemporary thing that's done quite often to uh, minimize the downstream uh, stuff that you have to do. But if the owner did not want to do that, the option is going in and replacing the culvert. So it's kind of either or. But all these things are very typical things that you'll see on subdivisions all through the state and not uh, owner's conditions. Uh, you know, where he's at, where he mentions uh, securing right away, one of the things, the easiest way we get right away for new roads is requiring it as projects develop. And yes, you end up with the checkerboard, but eventually, over time, you have enough people that do things on the property that allows you to get all the right-of-way that you're supposed to have as spelled out the code. So I can answer any questions. So you're saying the code has changed so that the width of a right-of-way, there's an existing 50-foot right-of-way along the ground. And you're saying the code has changed at some point and now requires 60 foot right of ways for running roads? That's what it's listed, 60 feet. And that's the, the minimum? <coughs> this is a one and a half lane road that's like 12 feet wide. Oh, 
you know, it doesn't if make you, any, doesn't If make you any ask sense. me, I would have different right away with, but I have one it's established in the code. statement earlier about taking the, the easement on, was that talking about the Shasta Spring side where you wanted to include that easement of what is currently a private road and add that to so in the future you could have your is that what you're talking about when you're talking about a yeah, one, of, one of the things when we have potential for development we were supposed to secure access to those, those <laughs> areas so that they can develop and have proper circulation. Uh, particularly if you look at the laws and the way the laws have been uh, uh, changed over the last couple of years, uh, when you go to develop, you are supposed to minimize uh, the um, amount of vehicles that are traveled by any individual on parcels and property. <coughs> so there might be a lot of times where they think, oh, we'll just do this area and then have people drive up and around and back in to go to that area. Well, they're not allowing that anymore. It's becoming uh, significant issues in some of these projects. So you have to um, minimize the amount of travel that you have for this project, and you have to be thinking about what you're going to be doing in projects in the future, because uh, you can uh, lock yourself out of being able to do things later on, um, depending on how the property the project is set up. What's the rationale for having the encroachment marked even before the property is, is sold? Um, we've had a, over time we've had a problem uh, with encroachments uh, being uh, placed. And people in Trinity have a tendency to build it and then ask for permission. And so what the intent is, is to have the encroachment marked on on the plan so that we know it's going to work and the property owner knows it's going to work. All it is is just essentially they're marking where it is. The new homeowner comes in, he wants it somewhere else. There's nothing that precludes him from coming and requesting it somewhere else. This is just something that establishes that we've agreed upon to provide that access to this property. And one of the things that you do through this is you try to identify any problems that might come forth. Uh, there are properties here uh, that are front roads that you actually have to drive through your neighbor's property to get to. And so that's, we identify the uh, encroachments to make sure that you, the property's accessible or if something else needs to be done to take care of beforehand. Can I add to that? Um, a comment as well. Um, a site visit um, occurred in October um, with our staff in, in the planning department and um, our consultant from SHN, Gary Reese. Um, at that time, we did notice there were um, there's a lot of topography on um, the por a portion of the parcel right where the road forks. Um, there's a lot of topography in that area and it appears several drainages. So this is something um, planning department staff encouraged as well just to delineate where the proposed driveway would be because of the topographical differences and the drainage situation. And it, again, it's, it's meant to show it's a starting point. It's meant to say, yes, we have access, we can get onto that property. New person not comes with some other idea, all you need to do is come in and ask. Yeah. So, you're, so you're not locked into it. No. Any other questions for the Yeah, I have a question about the code change that says it's a 60-foot. What code changed? I I was just referring to maybe a change from the date that they did the 50-foot to today's 60-foot code. I don't know when that was enacted. It was enacted at least 10-plus uh, years ago. But the burden is on a sub-developer now for an existing county road to um, dedicate additional property to the county because some code change. Yes, anytime you go through the entitlement process, uh, there's extractions to uh, uh, get
getting things that, that the community uh, calls for through the general plan and through the code. And so when he proposes this project, those are the things that we look at and condition if it calls for it. So what if this condition were not here? What would be the effect of the code had saying it should be here and it's not here? It, it, it's going against code. It's it's not con it'd not be consistent with county code. County code. Yes. Okay. So that's different than the subdivision map acts or something. Uh, the state um, streets and highways code calls for 40 feet. I have worked with 50 feet quite a bit, uh, but our county, because of the terrain, has determined a while back that 50 feet is appropriate, or 60, I'm sorry. Basically, I have a little bit of an interest in this project because I am the agent representing of the two parcels that they talked about briefly beyond the Shasta Springs Road as described on these maps. Um, there's two parcels there where part, two sisters owned a parcel and they quick claimed them by gift deed and they're required now to, to get a certificate of compliance to make those gift deeds valid. So that's the project that we're, we're talking about there. Um, on a little bit of an editorial perspective, just watching the process that's happening here is like, and, and Eric mentioned a little bit, most of what's being talked about in this meeting should have been done in a subject review committee meeting. That's the time when you get a chance to talk about conditions and what you can do about them and how they map, match the situation. If you look at the, the this project, 18-21 means it probably was app, the application went in in June of, eight, of not, not 2018. So that's 18 months ago. And from my understanding, the landowner didn't get knowledge of these conditions until sometime in October. And so we went for <coughs> over a year without knowing that these kind of conditions might be put on this property. And clearly, in, in my mind, $100,000 in excess for, for a uh, culvert would be more than the land might be worth by itself. And so that, that, that's a particular problem. But that should have been dealt with the subdivision, subdivision review committee. And I really think you should take it in terms of making sure that that subject your committee gets back on its feet and gets utilized for these kinds of things. Because that's the place where this kind of discussion should happen, not where somebody's got three minutes to talk about it or, or something else. Um, and, and Eric mentioned there's no maps. I actually told him that number, but I had done more research. So it was actually one parcel map and one sur record survey done in 2019. The recorder's office has changed their indexing of those kinds of things a little bit, so I didn't find them initially. But there was one of each of those recorded. In 2019, and the surveyors around town that I talk to are not taking new parcel map projects because they can't get them through, they can't get them done, and so they're they're simply saying I don't want to do that kind of project that's going to be held up for multiple years. Um, in in Andy Spence's response to the the letter from uh, the surveyor, he mentioned that they had asked for a dedication of 50 foot along Chatham Springs Road for that that two parcel project that I'm talking about. But I had spoke to the director after that and asked him if it wasn't reasonable to talk about maybe dedicating a trail. The, uh, I'm not going to leave copies of this. The Shasta Springs, the, the Weirville Basin Trail System calls for a Shasta Springs Trail. Right now it runs from Muster Hill to Shasta Springs. It calls for an extension of this road to Shasta Springs as a trail. And then that trail would also go down to the industrial park. So I think you should be aware of the fact that the trail system is, is actually looking for that. Just real quick, I think if you have a dedication, all of the record owners of the land that, that, are, that are impacted by that road dedication should be needing to sign the certificate, not just the landowner. 
Thank you. Commission Justin Hawkins from May 4th. Um, a couple things about the uh, memorandum. I noticed looking at it um, with respect to condition 12, um, it does say in here that they're recommending a replacement perhaps of these culverts. And the thing with these culverts is that they're actually a water course that's draining from way upstream, hundreds of acres up above. So hundreds of acres in this climate is going to need more than a 30-inch culvert down there. And I went and took a look at the site, and it got overtopped probably last year. You can tell they put riprap around the edge of the culvert. Probably the county, the county maintained road. I doubt they got an LSA for that activity. It's definitely in a water course. Or she could get it. Yeah, well, somebody did it. I don't know if they got an LSA, but if they got an LSA, then they would have done a hydrology <coughs> report to that culvert work there, possibly. So there's the, the study may have already been done, but it does seem the conditions the, pro, the developer should not be required to mitigate for pre-existing conditions. The last sentence of, of uh, the first paragraph for number 12, or impacts from other upstream properties. Culvert's already been overtopped. In fact, they've cut a cul they cut the top of the culvert on the inlet side open so it would allow more flow in without having to have a, uh, an overtop going down into the culvert. <clears throat> so they've already been working on the spot. I think it's a known issue. And to have the developer replace this doesn't make any sense. And also, when you go to get an LSA in Fish and Wildlife Inspection property, if you have a culvert on your property that's not your right of way, okay, the county maintained road, you don't have to get an LSA to replace that. That's the county's issue, the, the owner of the, of the road. So if this is a county road, then why would he have to be replacing any culverts at all, especially when most of the impacts are from way upstream? It's a negligible amount of area we're talking about. Like, let's say he paved his driveway. We're talking a fraction of an acre. So we're talking, I mean, less than, I don't even know, less than 1% of the whole area. I mean, we're talking about no impervious surface compared to the whole drainage up there. So I think that we should just allow the developer to go ahead and have his parcels. And if the county needs to upgrade those culverts, that's their responsibility. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak on this agenda item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the commission. Commissioners, any discussions, motions? Question. Well, I find the applicant's logic and position on these conditions more compelling than I find the OTs. I agree. But I also should bring up, I think there is a there is a line in condition six that talks about putting the hundred year flood on the map, but the last line of that condition says the flood study shall also evaluate the capacity of the culvert. If we take action that doesn't include 12, then probably would need to strike that site. Any other comments from the Commission? Well, I'll make a motion to uh, resolution number is 
Okay. And are we recommending this to the board, or is this our, is this a final action of the planning commission? Final action of the planning commission, unless it's appealed. Well, I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2020-01 and the conditions of approval minus conditions 10 through 13 and the last sentence of condition six. We have a motion. We have a second. All seconds. Okay, a motion and a second. And does this need to be a roll call vote or? Yes, okay. Resolution. There may be some discussion. And do we have any further discussion? Competing motions. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. And who's going to call out our roll? Aye. Basically, as I recall, we're told there was not really any need for one, at least at that time. And so this is something that I absolutely agree should have gone before the subdivision committee. Are there others like this that are just being held up in the planning department that we need to start having subdivision committee meetings again? Okay, what a question there. Um, yes, we need to reconvene the subdivision committee. We have a backlog of division projects, um, and parcel maps, um, uh, at least one tentative subdivision map that are backed up. Um, there hasn't been staff to process these projects is part of the issue. Um, however, um, regardless of the staffing issues, the subdivision committee is very much needed to, um, as the applicant and um, Mr. Portland and um, Mr. Keyes noted, that many of these issues could have been uh, discussed and negotiated, and um, the project could have moved forward with a much clearer understanding of what would be conditions versus getting to this point and the applicant giving the conditions um, shortly in advance of the meeting. Um, in fact, some couple of conditions were handed to them at the meeting. Unfortunately, in November, um, those were not ones on the list today that were struck. Um, but definitely, uh, the need for subdivision committee. Now, um, as the planning director, I do have a concern with the current um, organization of the subdivision committee and that is um, my question being is having a planning commissioner on that on that committee um, is that a conflict later on when that map comes before the commission and and that planning commissioner has been involved in that project um, so that's something that's been on my mind um, regardless, though, whether it's Commissioner Honor or it's how it's organized, we need to have this. It is very critical. Planning's been neglected. It's essential. I, I absolutely think that. Thank you. Okay, I believe that, that would be a question to ask County Council, rather, whether that would be a conflict or not. That's. I don't think I've ever seen us use the Subdivision Review Committee. Well, been on the board as long or longer than anybody here so um, and that's how it was set up I know when I first was on the commission I was the chairman of the subdivision review committee but I didn't know what it was 
So I, I actually sat, I attended, I was part of one, one in, in seven years. Right. Um, and I have discussed this matter with the uh, uh, county council, Margaret Long, um, and uh, I'll revisit that with her and, and uh, report back the next right. time commission meeting um, discussion and moving forward with uh, reconvening the resolution. Thank you. Mr. Chair, it seems like that same issue would apply to the architectural review committees. So if, if, there are, if we are in any committees, which two of us are, that meet on items brought before the commission, if that's an issue, we probably need to restructure it. Would be a good thing to know. Okay, moving on to item number four, conditional use permit P-19-18. An application requesting the 2,400 square foot single family dwelling in a 660 square foot shop to be conditionally approved in the TPZ zoning district. Project site is loaded, located at 10410 Core Service Road, 4N09 High and Palm, APN number 011-100-02. Applicant. Penske proposed CEQA determination exempt. Ella. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, this request is for a conditional use permit, as you said, to allow a single family dwelling with an accessory structure on a parcel zone timberland production zone in High and Palm. The applicant's consultant uh, of Down River Consulting is here tonight to an answer any site specific questions you might have. Um, the subsequent memo was provided to you that includes the Forest Service's um, comments and a revised resolution and conditions of approval that incorporates those comments. Um, the consultant has been updated on those requirements and staff recommends full approval. And do you have any questions? Any questions of staff? What's it look like? Okay. With that, um, we will open this item up to begin with uh, to the consultant and then we'll hear from the general public. Good evening, my name is Deidre Brower, I'm with Down River Consulting and uh, we've been working with the applicant Ms. Pinchke to um, help her get approval to develop a dwelling and a shop on this building, on this parcel. She. Um, had plans for a septic system and a, and a home in process. Uh, she purchased the house or the property in 2011, and um, there's no dwelling or anything on it. She would she would like to have one. Um, I did have one question on uh, condition uh, or not condition. I'm sorry. Um, just as uh, the the attachment one resolution number two B. Uh, makes the following findings and it uh, that last section of B it says as conditions this conditional use permit will not be detrimental to the public health safety or welfare um, and then or if it results in the creation of a public nuisance so I wasn't sure about that last section um, here I, I may just not understand what it means exactly or I'm not sure if it needs to be there I think that was just a clerical error. Oh, I can take out that. Sorry, I just found that, and I just wasn't sure about it. Thank you for finding that. Um, I think it's fairly straightforward. If you have any questions, um, <coughs> please let us know. And Marie has more information um, on the environmental conditions. Does anyone have any questions for the consultant? Right off the bat, um, I do have one question. I don't know if you would have the ability, but do you have a more detailed map or a map that can be read? read? Um, it's, I do uh, have another map. The, the, the map I have is pretty grainy. You can't really see anything on it. <coughs> Up to public comment, and 
Is there anybody that would like to speak on this <coughs> item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the commission. <coughs> Commissioners? Discussion? kind of hoping we would have a Cal Fire representative here tonight to discuss their um, condition because it, it, Cal Fire says they're required to meet fire safe code and I was wondering if that would include fire rated road all the way to their residence when they're going to be traveling over miles and miles of federal roads. How, how could we require them to upgrade the forest roads to meet CAL FIRE standards? I uh, know, they would just be focusing on their driveway. From their driveway, yeah, okay. Any other questions for staff? Safety or welfare. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Once this uh, conditional use permit, does this need to be a roll call vote also, or is this just a voice vote? It's a resolution, so it, I would think it should be in roll, roll call vote. Yes, that's your roll call. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, as you stated, this is a request for an initial annual commercial cannabis setback variance from three neighboring residential dwellings on Ferris Springs Road in Junction City. The applicant, Amelia Kotsiva, and her consultant, Mitch Ivanoff, are here tonight. If you have any questions for them, um, additionally, Christy Anderson from Environmental Health is here to answer any comments relating to her or any questions relating to her comment. Um, and then I stated on page three of the staff report, due to a concerned neighbor's comment and a concerned agency comment from Environmental Health Division, staff was unable to fully meet required finding number three and thus has to recommend denial of the variance. Uh, I would like to mention that while we did receive supportive neighbor comment letters, it is not appropriate for staff to determine which neighbor's complaints are valid and which are not. It is my task to present commissioners with all comments, and it's the responsibility of the commission to deny or approve. Um, additionally, uh, per Planning Commission precedent and Trinity County Code, I am unable to fully meet one of the required findings, and I have to recommend denial, as I previously stated. Um, we did engage in preliminary conversation with the applicant prior to application submittal and expressed our concerns with the high volume of residences and uh, previous variance denials in the area. And with that, do you have any questions? Any questions, staff? Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, before we open it up to the general public, I will give the applicant and or her consultant an opportunity to come forward first. Good evening everybody. My name is Smith. I'm independent consultant from Lewiston. I will speak for Emilia because uh, she <laughs> does not speak very English. I would like to uh, mention to you that uh, uh, to date uh, she spoke with the concerned neighbors and maybe there is a change of opinion in supporting uh, the, this variance and I also spoke with the planning department and they suggested to me that if there is support from the concerned neighbor, uh, planning would uh, suggest approval of this uh, variance. And uh, approval of this variance is the last item uh, applicant needs in order to obtain the cannabis cultivation license. They have already built residence 50%. Uh, the residence 50% completed and they uh, fully comply with all environmental, county, and state uh, regulations. If you have any questions, I would be glad to answer. Any questions for the consultant? When you say there may have been a change in yes. from the neighbor, you're saying they're reconsidering their, their concerned comment? Concerned neighbor is here tonight and uh, we will hear what they have to say. So, But I would like you to consider this uh, because it's very important and it would uh, constitute change in planning department's uh, opinion whether to approve or to deny this. Do you have any comments on the agency comment regarding um, the water issues that the Environmental Health Department is looking at? Uh, uh, no. <coughs> any other questions for the consultant? Is this, is this an existing cultivation site that's being brought into compliance? Uh, it's uh, brand new. Brand new, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, we will open to the general public. Anybody wishing to speak on this agenda item can approach the podium and comment. Good evening. I'm uh, Jack Eggleston. I'm the one of the owners that didn't comment that is in the 350 foot area there. And uh, I wanted to get my voice in here. I um, a 30 year public service career and I retired in this area after visiting here family for many years. And we did a lot of our vacations were camping and that. So we love the, this kind of area where we live. 
We moved here. We love the pines. We love the smells. Uh, we love being able to keep our windows open at night. Um, we no longer can do that for about a third of the year because of the uh, aroma of the, of the marijuana from the several grows that are in the, already close to us. Um, we're, um, <clears throat> in, during that season, I've also developed allergies. I've never had allergies before, but with this heavy marijuana smell, I've got allergies in the fall now. Uh, also, uh, we're concerned about having our grandchildren playing in such close proximity to this grow because it would be close to our property line, and that area is a big play area for our grandkids when they come to visit us. Um, uh, another concern we have is the drop in property values. If we have a grow so close to our property, we already know people are trying to sell property and having to drop their prices over and over. They're not able to buy, get, find buyers at this point. I don't know for certain if it's a marijuana, but they seem to think it is. And um, another area of concern is the criminal element. We read the papers and hear about um, during the harvest season and thereafter, people have been broken into as much as murders in some of the surrounding areas over there. They're trying to. Uh, take possession of somebody else's property. And I don't want my property to be mistaken for the one that's right next door. Um, the uh, last main, main thing I'm concerned about is if there's a variance given, is if there's follow-up on. I know it's supposed to be an annual one, but there was a grow next to us before that was way down by the river. Um, we They gave a variance for a three or six months for them to hook up a fifth wheel on the property. That was over five years ago. It's still sitting there. Nobody's doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, they've also now built, moved in a, a, a motor home. Nobody lives there. There's two vehicles that are just ugly out in our site. Um, they moved in a school bus at the end of their grow. It burned down in the Helena fire. You know, we were told that if we didn't clean up our properties, County would come in and do it with paint. That school bus is still sitting in the flood plain down there. Uh, sure, it's not, not a good thing at all. Um, and I'm concerned about something where if I want to complain about a marijuana grow in the future, I'm going to have to pay to do it, which I don't understand that either. Mm -hmm. So if we allow something to go in, then I'm looking at future problems too. Thank you. Could you clarify which parcel you, you are? I'm, I'm parcel, can I call and point it to you? Well, are you off of Red Hill Road? Yeah, yes, 14. So 14, 14, the one yeah. that didn't provide a comment. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sherry Mondeal, and I have a parcel number 0095103. Thirteen, and if you look on this this map here, no. my house is not in the zone, but my the back of my property line runs almost the whole length of his uh, west property line, and if you look where the hoop house would be positioned, that's right directly where in line with my well, and there's just not enough distance between the Hope House and my well for me to feel comfortable with my water quality, um, how much water they'll be taking from me, if it's going to be polluted. Um, I don't know, you know, if there's guarantees on that, but I do have a genuine concern about my water because of my uh, well being so close to the Hope House. And, um, and like Jack, my property values too, I feel will go down with, you know, if you look out on my back porch and you see a big hoop house now, I don't have anything against growing marijuana. I moved up here to see the woods. I didn't move up here to be in a farm area. And um, that's just my opinion, Ed, but you know, I am concerned about my, my water. Thank you. Thank you. I'm 
Betty Williams, and I have a little survey here that you can see probably better. Then the, this is their property, this is my property, and this is Jack's property right here. Hold it up so right if you can see that, how close everything is. And uh, we have had, a, I don't know if it's a gas smell or a sulfur smell, something new in our water. The, uh, it happened about two months ago. Yeah, had, I, I had a new water heater, but the, it's still there, so I'm going to have to have it right there, right here. And um, so I don't know what's going on there, but, you know, we have that place on the corner. And we're downhill, so it could be that it's coming down. Um, so now we have another problem. Uh, we've consulted some people. I have an iron filter, but now with Wilfred, we're going to have to get a smell filter <laughs> and an iron filter, and it's going to cost us $5,000 for a whole new system now. And they guarantee that that will take away the smell, but I'm not sure that it will. Um, I'm against marijuana. It makes me sick. And like Jack, we can't open our windows five months out of the year because it smells like skunk. And um, so I'm just, uh, this here is, is right across from my house. My house is 60 feet from their facility. We, my house is 30 feet from the, the road, and then the road is 30 feet, and then their property. So I talked to her today. She, I said, I told her I didn't want to like it. My son said he didn't care. And so I said, well, put it over there somewhere, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, that's my opinion. Thank you. I'm Sharon Eggleston, Jack's other half, not his better half, but his other half. Um, we've been in our home for 20 years, ever since we got burned out with the BLM controlled burn, you might recall, in Lewiston. And we love where we live. I particularly love absolute dark at night. I'm not looking forward to having a tinted thing that's lit all year, all night. Uh, being here 20 years, we were like before the grows started. And so we were against that, but you know, as uh, decisions were made by the county, we kind of swallowed it thinking, okay, well at least it's going to be far from us. We won't have that encroaching on our happy little life. It never occurred to me that there could be a variance issue popping up that would bring it back into our lives so close, just so close. Uh, we really would hope that you would deny this. Um, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. nitrogen issue and the water contamination possibly. Um, the obvious solution that they do in a lot of places is a concrete floor in the greenhouse that goes to a holding tank and that's common for indoor cultivation too. It's required. You're not allowed to discharge um, waste, water waste to a uh, septic system. So they would have, this is an easy system, it's not a big deal, it's pretty common. So they could put a slab with a drain and then have that pump taken to somewhere or usually what you do is you let the uh, water evaporate off and you're left with whatever residuals there and that can be disposed of at a hazard waste facility. And also inside the cannabis general order from the water board is a nitrogen management plan that is probably not required for this site because of the size, but you know that could be something the county could consider as a mitigation. So both those two things probably would contain nitrogen and contamination at that site for potential contamination. Um, so I wanted to just mention real quick on page four of the staff report. Um, 
Item number, well, it's, it's, it's uh, number four, beginning of the fourth page. The second paragraph down starts with the general purpose of the zoning code. So the second sentence from that paragraph reads, the proposed project is substantially in compliance with the zoning code provisions for commercial cannabis cultivation, which the county has found are necessary to reduce the potential impacts associated with unregulated cannabis cultivation. To me, this sounds like the idea we've talked about before, where licensing is a mitigation for unregulated cannabis in the county. And there's been pushback on that idea before, that licensing is not the mitigation. When, you know, back in 2016 and even 15, the idea is we have an unregulated situation, we need to bring everyone into compliance through some measure, carrot or stick. This right here says basically that licensing is a mitigation to our problems in this county. I just thought that this was relevant to the broader picture of uh, the program in the county and uh, where the program stands. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make one more comment because what uh, Sharon said about uh, the light, I, I didn't even think about that, but my bedroom faces right where that is, which means, and I have big sliding doors because I like to look out at night. I will have that light coming into my bedroom every night. And, um, you know, like Sharon, I moved up here to look at the stars and the trees, and um, that's, you know, that's about all I could say about that. I didn't move up here for that. You know, I, I don't care how you cut it, licensed or not. Um, Cooper's Bar Estates is one of the one of the finer was one of the finer rural residential neighborhoods in our community in our county and the fact that these grows have come in and popped up i can understand why people don't want to live there and i've seen a lot of people like the eaglestons that moved up here bought a home and have left and like the eaglestons they were contributors and to our community volunteer efforts in a lot of different areas and now they're gone for pop and you know that's all I got to say about that. Hi, Veronica Kelly Alves, Douglas City. Um, the comment I want to make is about the word mitigation. It's such a pretty word, and it looks really good on paper. And that's really about the weight it has in some cases. Um, we have um, experience throughout the county. You guys really trying to. To work for us and do things for us and you put it on paper but there's no bite to the enforcement they have to give 24 hours notice before they can show up for an inspection and I can clean my house in 24 hours um, and so something to keep in mind when we're making these when these decisions come before you in any capacity is what is the public benefit what is the whole public benefit not you know these the applicant as well both sides um, we all need a place to live, industry and non-industry. Finding that balance is proving tricky. But when a variance is put in place to help create that balance, and there is problems with it, then it's something that should be taken a look at. You can mitigate almost anything in this world on paper, but will it realistically get done? If it's not done, we have to pay now for complaints I'm hearing. I'm going to research that one. Um, how does that protect the public? How does that protect public welfare, health, and safety? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would complain about this burnout bus. Oh. I'm going to order. Good. I'm order. It doesn't belong. Oh, we need to, to have people one time to the podium, please. I, I know I let one already get away with it. I should have never done it. Um, you, you get your three minutes one time. Thank you. <laughs> Two years. Good evening, everyone. I'm Steve Roadhouse. 
and they listen to all these different aspects of um, there's a, two trains of thought I keep seeing. And one of them is to have cannabis, whatever <coughs> kind of operation is, spread throughout the county kind of in a checkerboard pattern. Perhaps you can remember when the Forest Service owned every other section and SP owned every other section of land in Trinity County and what a conundrum that became and even how the Forest Service has tried to consolidate and move their lands together so it's more manageable. The other relates to the comprehensive plan. I think it's been spoken of in the general plan or the community plan that actually would come up with some kind of community plan for each area to orderly uh, and have it well conceived instead of just being random. And a lot of what I just hear here is just random parts, we want this, we want variances, we want mitigation. It would seem more prudent to have an orderly approach so that it doesn't become chaotic. And I know that's a big, a big, 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 big job. This is all brand new to everybody. But um, specific areas seem to be needed, so, you know, it's kind of like the opt-out for certain areas, right? There was some set up early on and some not, and, and you know, there's a battle in trying to uh, accomplish that, like the Rush Creek area. So, you know, it just... I think as a general way of thinking of it, is it going to be random or is it going to be orderly? Thanks. Uh, good evening, commissioners and staff. John Brower from Junction City. And um, I do have a comment here on uh, it's finding number three where it discusses uh, down at the bottom of the page um, says additionally the environmental health division has expressed concerns that this project has the potential to be injurious to public welfare due to its potential to negatively impact water quality in the surrounding region and watershed um, I see environmental health here perhaps you can discuss briefly um, <clears throat> this finding but uh, all commercial cannabis licensing has to uh, satisfy water board uh, requirements before they can apply for a county permit. And the water board order uh, is, is very clear about runoff. Um, and uh, it seems like this, this particular issue might be the county kind of poking its nose in uh, in a redundant way on what is really a water board issue, and if the uh, if the the operation is discharging, it's really a water board issue, um, and, and not a county issue. Um, uh, Christy, can you speak briefly to this and explain a little bit? Um, only if she's direct asked by the planning commission. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the city. Yeah, on, on tier one and tier two that uh, John was just talking about, tier one is the responsibility of the county. It's tier two that's the responsibility of the state. When um, that slope for discharge becomes greater than 35 percent. Thank you. Okay. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the planning commission. Commissioners, any questions of staff? Well, I did um, one question I have, Mr. Chair. Uh, Christy, could you speak to the, your comments and the issues? Sure. Um, my my position my position is to protect the public's health and welfare. And um, wells in particular, or water for human consumption, is, is the responsibility of the county. So when we talk about uh, the effects of 
potential for groundwater contamination. We're talking nitrates and nitrites, which are the same um, potential contaminants that you see coming from septic systems. And I would have the same exact concern as the septic systems going in that location. Um, it's very toxic to baby pregnant women very quickly. And I mean, really, the whole population. Um, now, is there anything specific out of that? No, I don't know. There's no question. There's the objection was raised about responsibility. It, it absolutely is a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I, if I can just add something to that, it's my understanding, although I could be mistaken, it's been known to happen, that um, the water board is responsible for surface water and that environmental services then would be the keeper of the wells. Um, we do have a water quality ordinance, which we regulate. Um, environmental health does locally. Um, however, as far as surface water runoff and how that's concerned, we kind of co-mingle. Um, but drinking water is always our number one priority. So you recommended a uh, condition that there would be a concrete floor greenhouse for this project <coughs> under environmental health under the conditions of approval. So one of one of the conditions I did mention as a concrete floor greenhouse is, is a possible mitigation measure. Um, however, I think there is some other building issues that would go along with that because of the area that it's in that I'm not an expert in. Um, Possibly with regulatory or kind of your footprint. Is that mentioned? <coughs> Is it a five years? Okay. Um, there was mention of I'm not a, I'm not a build I'm not a building inspector, um, but the concrete floor would have to drain off into the tank that's pumped regularly, and that is something we've looked at at other sites. Maybe not as conducive in the Any other questions of staff? Would anyone care to make a motion? I, I would like to add one comment. Um, I do believe as mentioned from a member of the public that the compliance is one of the main mitigation tools for the cannabis industry environmentally. However, based on the proximity of the neighboring residents and the disservice of the placement of this operation yields, it is difficult to support. Therefore, I recommend and I make a motion to deny, I make a motion to deny commercial cannabis variance application CCB 1960 for Amelia Kosova for the reasons that this variance requires requ request is unable to fully met requirement finding number three to service not permitted per Trinity County Code 17.31.010.C and in addition to the comments made by neighboring residents. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. And uh, any other comments? Competing, competing motions? I just would like to make one comment, and that is that um, even though I agree that licensing serves as a mitigation and um, and it kills me to do it I, I have to agree that in this case it's probably not not in the best interest of the neighborhood okay. well. mr. chair I just have to make one comment with regards yes, to sir. there should be specific findings made about how it is injurious to the public health safety and welfare because that's section three here that you're saying um, so we need to have something specific that says 
we're denying it because it is injurious to the public welfare and adjacent properties, which you mentioned the public comments. Um, but I think you should specify in your motion that it's due to lighting, noise, um, odor, and, and those types of things that are injurious to the public. And make it specific. Would you like to amend your motion? Yes, very well. Thank you, Council. I will amend my motion to include the findings of lack of better thought, I guess, how this would injure the proximity of uh, the quality of water that can potentially be uh, damaged by the proximity of this cultivation site to property and well number, I don't have the APN number, but would that suffice, Council, without me having to get into further detail? Yes. So I amend my motion as I stated. I will second the amended motion. Okay, we have an amended motion and second. I'm still struggling with this new uh, system we're doing here and whether or not we need all these to be roll call votes or not. So help me out here, staff. Do we need to? In the spirit of the evening, why don't we just stick to roll call votes? Okay, thank you. <laughs> and, and Chair, you should vote on the amendment first and then vote on the motion as amended. Okay. So, so just take the first and, and whether or not there's agreement in total to the amendment, which adds the specific findings. So do that first. Okay, so we will be voting on amending the motion? Yes. Okay. Or that could just be a competing motion, I guess. But we'll. We'll take it. We won't do the roll call for the uh, amendment of the motion, I guess. We will just ask for a voice vote. Um, all in favor of the amended motion? I, I, I said I, I'm oh, confused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, you have two, you have two you things happening right now. Why don't you withdraw you your think? motion and make your motion yeah. as a, you know, the, the make same same thing is good. Yeah. It's yeah. very simple. Extremely simple. No, I, I'm just saying, what you've done is very simple. He's made a motion, and then he amended that motion. So you have to vote on the amendment to that motion. So all you would be doing is voting on adding the specific findings of the damage to the well, being specific finding which is injurious to public health, safety, and welfare. Yeah, you vote on that. We've never done this before. Yes, no. I, I do agree. I, I will um, withdraw my motion and restate it. Oh, yeah. It suffices, Council. Uh, so I will make a motion to deny commercial cannabis various application CCB 19-60 Emilia Kosova for the reasons that this variance request is unable to fully meet requirement number three, the service not permitted per Trinity County Code 17.31.010.C based on the findings that it is injurious to the public and potentially harm adjacent water resources for public consumption. Okay, we have a new motion. I'll second that one also. And a second. So now we will continue with the roll call vote. Okay, Commissioner Stewart. Aye. Commissioner McHugh. Aye. Commissioner Matthews. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries unanimously. Moving on. Chair Frazier, can we take a five minute I was break? just going to suggest that we take a short recess before we jump into the item number six. So we will reconvene at 8.30. Okay, we will reconvene and moving on to item number six. Uh, rezone and conditional use permit P-17-45, application requesting number one to rezone an approximate 5.5 acre project site located at 30661 State Highway 3 and 123 141 and 221 Marshall Ranch Road, Douglas City. 
from the Highway Commercial Zoning District to cannabis, uh, to Heavy Commercial C3 Zoning Distance and two, a conditional use permit for a commercial cannabis distribution facility. This project was previously considered by the Planning Commission in January, uh, the January 10th, 2019 meeting and the January 17th, 2019 meeting. The CEQA determination and rezone components of this project were considered by the Board of Supervisors upon appeal on February 20th, 2019. APN numbers 015-490-08, and 11. Applicants T mines proposed sequent determination mitigated neck deck. Staff. Oh, and we did have comments from County Council in regards to this to begin with. Yes, it was brought to our attention uh, before this meeting started today that there is an ongoing litigation involved in this particular item, and we wanted to make sure that all parties are aware that there has not been any stay of these proceedings or in that hearing, so you can hear it today, but if any council member or commissioner, I should say, is um, feeling like the fact that there is a litigation involving this is going to cause them to not be able to remain fair and impartial or unbiased um, in any way, shape, or form on this item, you can certainly recuse yourselves. So if it's having an effect on whether or not you think you can make a decision, um, you should consider that. Okay, everybody understand that? All right, staff. Okay, thank you. A bit of a disclaimer here, and um, there are um, a few things I want to clarify in the project description. Um, this is a um, project with a long history, and um, and so um, I've had to learn it very quick. Uh, maybe not so well, but I've given it my best shot. So uh, to clarify in the project description, um, this item was also considered by the Planning Commission in April 2018. And also, a uh, clarification was not appealed to the Board of Supervisors. It was forwarded by the um, Afton Planning Director, Rick Tippett. It was not appealed. It was just forwarded by the Planning Director under the provisions of our code. So, uh, no appeal, <coughs> just for clarification. I apologize for those mistakes. Okay. Um, so I will get on with my staff report. Um, as read, this is an application requesting to rezone approximately 5.5 acre project site, 5.5, 5.6, located um, on State Highway 3 um, at Marshall Ranch Road. Um, there are four parcels included in the project, four assessor parcels. The application is for a rezone from the Highway Commercial Zoning District to the Heavy Commercial, C3. Zoning District. The proposed environmental determination for this project is a mitigated negative declaration. Following the January 17th meeting, um, oh, actually, let me scoot, scoot back there and let's recap what happened at the January 17th, 2019 Planning Commission meeting. Um, at that time, uh, three separate public hearings were held for the project, for each component of the project, um, or were scheduled. Scheduled. The first uh, hearing was for the mitigated negative declaration um, that was approved for recommendation of board supervisors by a four to one vote. Then the second public hearing was held for the rezone um, from the highway commercial to the heavy, heavy commercial district. Um, that uh, was uh, a vote of four to one to deny a recommendation of denial for the rezone. At that time, a uh, public hearing nor a recommendation was formed for the CUP component of the project. When the project was forwarded to the Board of Supervisors at their February 20th, 2019 meeting, they only uh, reviewed and considered public hearing for the mitigated negative declaration portion of the project and the reason uh, not the entire project. Um, this is um, been challenging um, as I've taken on this project and trying to backtrack and uh, uh, move the project forward. So when the project went to the Board of Supervisors in February, 
the Board of Supervisors reviewed the mitigated negative declaration, the recommendation for approval by the Planning Commission, and decided that more work um, needed to be done on the environmental analysis regarding soils, traffic, and odor. <coughs> then the rezone was tabled until the mitigated neg negative declaration returned to the Board. And that's how it was left. So, this project, which you may be asking, why is this before us again? Okay. Yes. <coughs> I believe that actually we did have a hearing on the rezone and took a motion with a vote. I'm sorry, there was a public hearing on the rezone and there was a vote to recommend denial for one vote. So they there tabled There was no it. public... At the board, the board tabled it, was that what you have? The, the right. All right. Okay, so there was, there was a public hearing at the Planning Commission on the 17th mm -hmm. for the rezone. The rezone was recommended for a denial and then the third hearing for the third component of the project, the CUP, which is a pivotal part of the project, was not held. The Planning Commission did not have a recommendation on that component. So when it went to the board, there was only mitigating negative declaration and the reason, no CUP. Um, so the um, question is, I, I feel that there's probably a question out there, why is this back in front of the planning commission? And, and I, there's two reasons for that. Uh, the first is considered the staff responses based on the direction given by the board to reevaluate soil, traffic, and odor. Um, resources um, associated with the project. And the second is to consider the project in, in its entirety. To move forward with the project, we must have the project, the entire project together to take to the board. And so revisiting this, this CUP, um, this, this public hearing will be held as one public hearing, not three for each of the components. Um, so you'll be considering the project in all of its entirety. I uh, it's been a while, but just thinking back, it, it seems to me the reason we didn't consider the CUP was because the denial of the rezone made the CUP not possible because the project was not uh, con was not compatible use even with a conditional use permit in the highway commercial zoning. So without rezoning to heavy commercial. The CUP was null and void. It could not be done. That's why we didn't pick that up. I understand that logic, but moving forward with the project and only having part of it go to the Board of Supervisors is problematic. It needs to be viewed in its entirety, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, the, I have a question. I guess that would be for Council, then. How could we consider a CUP on a project that, zoning-wise, if we if we said we did not recommend a zoning change, how could we consider the CUP that wouldn't be allowed in the zoning that we were recommending it stay at? If without recommending it be rezoned to C3, to heavy commercial, we can't, we can't pass a CUP to allow the project to go forward and, and the, the we, could, we could get uh, public input on the CUP on the record and then there have, will have been a public hearing, which it sounds like we'll have tonight. So okay. there's a public hearing on the record, and we could, if if the C3 thing does not happen, we could recommend the board uh, a denial of the other one based on zoning. Okay. All right. So we're just going to have one broad public hearing where it, it's a free for all, whichever part of the project you want to talk about, and then um, we'll go from there. Is what I'm getting from staff. Yes, and it's affording due process to all parts of the components of the project to the applicant. And if you were at the last time to have denied the CUP based on the non-zoning, it would have been fine. But because it never was actually held and brought forward, that's the problem. Okay. Anything else? Oh, yes. Much okay. <laughs> Continue. Well, not much more. But more. Okay, so I'm, I just will briefly review, we go into great depth in the staff report. Um, I will briefly review um, uh, our analysis of the three items that we're supposed to, actually kind of four, three and a half, um, that were evaluated for the mitigate negative declaration um, for the direction of the Board of Supervisors. 
Um, the first is hazardous materials and soil contamination. Um, and I think this is a very important point to make, that CEQA generally does not require public agency um, to analyze the impact of existing environmental conditions um, might have on a project's future users or residents. Um, so simply put, it's the effect of the project on the environment, not the environment on the project. Um, and that was a, a question regarding the uh, past historical use of the site, the potential contaminants, the soil and water. Um, so the agency must analyze how environmental conditions might adversely affect the project's re residents or users only where the project itself might worsen the existing situation. Um, in this case, there are, not, there are no residences, there are no schools. Um, this is a distribution facility with possibly up to 10 employees um, maximum. Um, and so uh, we're not looking at uses that would be affected by the contamination, such as a residence. So again, uh, it's the effect of the, the project on the environment, not the environment on the project. And the use of this nature, we don't see a significant impact. Um, the staff report goes into um, the soil samples that were done. The soil samples were taken at the site <laughs> and tested. Um, and um, arsenic, cadmium, and lead were looked at um, specifically. Um, and there was, um, you know, arsenic obviously is natural occurring. Uh, we did not see um, anything that would trigger a significant impact as regarding soil contamination. Uh, the results of the reevaluation of, of potential hazards and materials of the soils of the project site. Um, it remains clear that off-site contamination has not impacted the project site, and the development of the post proposed project will have less than significant impact with that respect to hazards from soil contamination. Um, with the soil contamination uh, discussions, and this was not specifically directed by the Board of Supervisors for staff to explore, but um, with soil, we also took a look at water, so kind of added that, that other item in, in the evaluation. And as noted in the soils um, evaluation, um, there was a, 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 there was an analysis um, done. And no groundwater contamination was present um, at the off-site properties, and for the on-site property, uh, applicant has documentation um, about the on-site water well, has available water supplies. Uh, needed for the proposed uses. So we did not see um, issues with water contamination or for the proposed use, uh, the availability of water uh, for that distribution use specifically. Um, third item is um, traffic. Um, we do have Department <coughs> of Transportation Director Rick Tippett here this evening. And I'm not sure if Ann is still here. He might have escaped. But we do have Rick here to answer any questions. Um, the staff is of the opinion um, that um, maintains that um, with the access of Highway 3 to the distribution facility and the access would be limited with the CUP just to traffic from Highway 3, not Marshall Ranch Road. Um, that a, um, this, the traffic, the level of service is well within the parameters. Uh, there is no significant impact. Um, uh, I have Rick here, so I'm going to defer to him if there's any further questions on the traffic. Um, uh, but uh, again, um, we determined that the impacts associated with the development of this project were less than significant regarding traffic. Air quality um, slash odor slash smell. Um, this is always a tough one. Um, smell and odor are so subjective. However, the distribution facility um, will not, uh, there will be no cultivation, processing, um, and uh, manufacturing proposed with the project. As previously evaluated, cannabis odors are known to be the most significant from cannabis flowers and live plants grown indoors uh, and from processing and manufacturing. So why it is likely that some odor will occur in <coughs> the cannabis distribution facility, it's unlikely that the le levels of odors will be significant. 
also want to state that neither the county cannabis regulations related to distribution or the California Bureau of Cannabis Control, BCC, has specific regulations or requirements for odor control at distribution facilities. Um, since the proposed use would not have a cannabis cultivation processing or manufacturing, the potential impacts from the odors affecting off-site properties is considered to be low. And county staff's opinion is that there will be less than significant impact on air quality related to cannabis odors with the implementation of the proposed project. Uh, with that, again, odor is highly subjective. Um, should the proposed project use be developed and odors cause significant issues, it will be the applicant's responsibility uh, to reduce or eliminate odor um, leaving the property. Appropriate actions reduce odor emission should they become an issue may include, may include excuse me, the implementation of odor reducing practices, the installation of odor reduction mechanical equipment, or the equivalent or combination of both. The project permittee would be responsible for future odor reduction methods should they determine to be required to become a nuisance. In conclusion, um, based on the discussed findings, staff is of the opinion that the original findings of the initial study mitigate, uh, and mitigated negative declaration regarding soil, water, traffic, um, soil, water, traffic, and odor remain valid and no change to the initial study is warranted at this time. Any future um, proposed projects, um, amendments, change project descriptions, are going to require permit oversight from the county, which would further evaluate the impacts of those proposed uses on the site should they come in the future. Um, so we do need to focus on, on the project, and that is a distribution facility. Okay, and um, also touched in the staff report is the consideration of the project in, the entirety, in its entirety, which I think we've covered quite well on, on that point. So um, I feel like I'm missing something, but I'm sure it will come up. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Do you have any questions for staff at this point? Okay. Aside from the additional CEQA work mm -hmm. that was done um, in response to the request from the board to look at those three items, are there any changes whatsoever in the application? From what was done, in, from what we looked at in January, or is it the, 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 the project, the application is identical, yes. with the exception of this additional SQL information. Uh, yes, additional analysis on those issues. Okay. Uh, no changes to the project whatsoever. All right, thank you. Except the project description. The current project description, unless I'm reading it wrong, is asking for a distribution facility, and the original one in 2019 was for a storage and distribution facility. The storage and distribution distribution facility would be correct. We go for 2019, that was my mistake. Okay. Okay, any other questions for staff before we open the public comment? Just a, just a question about the public notice. Mm -hmm. So I mean, in some of the comments that we received, they said the notice was given or received on Friday, January 3rd, and comments were due on Monday, the next, the next business day. Is, it, is that, uh, I mean, that just seems like a really quick turnaround. Yes, and but we did, we do accept comments. Uh, to make it into the staff report and to get those dis distributed to you, um, like in a, in a memo, um, it, it's a tough turnaround. Uh, so yes, that is would be correct. Um, there are also comments made that the office is closed on Fridays, and that's when the staff report becomes available. So in the future, we'll make sure to um, uh, have some wording in our notices that uh, we can have staff reports available somehow on Fridays. Even if, even if the office is closed, we're still there. I would be happy to get those staff reports out. Um, 
I wish it wasn't that way, but that is the way we did the staff report down on Friday as directed by the planning commission. Technically, they don't need to go out until 72 hours in advance to meet. Thank you. All right, no more questions of staff. With that, we will open this up to public comment. <laughs> Applicant first? Yeah. Uh, if the, yeah, I see the applicant back there. We will hear from the applicant first. And before we get really into this, I would ask people to, to if you if you hear somebody say the same thing that you're going to say, in the spirit of getting out of here before midnight, could we try not to be redundant? Mr. Mines, go ahead, sir. Well, we're back. Um, I think there was a little misconfusion on some things, but I believe we're here to try and provide some jobs for this community. We're here uh, based on, they've given us a path to start this process, and everybody here still doesn't really have many outlets, and I'm um, still the best option and the best opportunity, not that I really want to be that anymore. But we're a little deep into this one now, and uh, I would like to uh, get past all the prior ridiculousnesses that you guys had heard that weren't truths. You know, you had a lot of things that we had to come back and spend some more money to prove that the wells were good, the ground was safe. Um, I know I'm accused of creating smells there. There's a kid that goes to school there and at Shasta College in the house. Um, I know there's a lot of still false accusations. I don't really want to get there. I just want to get to where we can provide jobs. I brought a lot of people here today that actually want a job. Um, they, they want to live here. They, they want to make this a better community. They want more than three restaurants in Weaverville. They'd like some economic viability and some economic revitalization. And that's what I'm willing to do is revitalize an area of this county that has not been utilized in quite a long time. It's a perfectly acceptable area. Um, I know everybody's worried about smells. It's actually, like you said, it's a processed product. It's in a jar. You guys, there's not going to be any smell, but we can put a HIPAA filter up if for some reason someone can smell through sealed jars. Um, I can do that. Um, as far as um, safety, it will be safe 100%. It will have all the necessary means the state of California is forcing me into having to make it that way, and we will do that. Um, we're not going to be some huge, large business. I don't think that's even feasible anymore with where our whole ordinance is gone and where things are going. It's more about survival at this point. And I think that um, a lot of people are counting on me and myself and my family to survive here and a lot of young people that would like jobs that actually want to have a future here. So um, we, I do, by the way, um, I do have a manufacturing plant. That's down at my house. So there is not going to be manufacturing there. I know people threw this all into me. I know they were scared of water and ice because that's what we use to manufacture. It's a terrifying thing. Didn't even have to get sprinklers from the fire department. That's how ser seriously scary it is. Um, but we're just, we need a place to distribute. And based on the way the ordinances were laid out and the way the zonings all had to be, we couldn't do it on our property. So we had to have something. And everyone kind of needs this. So I think it's important to push this forward based on jobs. And, uh, and we'll do this right. This is what we want to do. Thank you. Is there any questions I can answer? But there is no manufacturing. We already have that set up somewhere else. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else like to speak to this item? Public comment, yes. Good evening, Liam Gogan, Douglas City. Sorry for cutting off Terry there. Who's getting up? Um, I think tonight you're going to hear from our community, Devil City, that uh, we do not want this facility here. It's not in the right place. You probably see 150 odd signatures. Um, every neighbor of this parcel, north, south, east, and west, is against this. Um, we, she had said, if there's an odor uh, complaint that the owner would have to take care of it. And I, I was looking and it came that there's 43 trips in and out of this facility which is capable of triggering a traffic 
uh, investigation if it goes over 50. So right now we're at 86% of that capacity. Who is responsible for any portion of maybe putting a right hand turn lane in there? Does it go to the owner? Does it come to the people? Um, I think it's environmentally unsound. And I also know that there is um, better places for this, um, especially in um, Hayfork. There's a few of them there. I know there's a, a big professional company coming to Hayfork that will do exactly what this is going to do. Um, they are proven, and they are going to employ a lot of people at probably a lot higher rate. So there will be manufacturing distributing in, in our county, um, and maybe just a few miles away from there. But um, you will be seeing, I think, at the next board meeting, a rep uh, presentation from a very reputable group of manufacturers that own, uh, have, have been proven to be successful, environmentally <laughs> sound um, group that has done very well everywhere they've gone. And uh, they're going to do it in a place that does not need a zoning change. Um, does not have 150 of the of Douglas City, as we all know, there's not a whole bunch of people in Douglas City. That's a large portion of our of our community. Also, I don't want to put off that um, that Douglas City myself or, or most of these people on the on the signature list are anti cannabis. You know, we are not. Um, we are uh, we are open to cannabis. We would like to have manufacturing in our county, it's going to come, we need it. Um, and also on the signature list, you will find many people who grow cannabis on that list. So it's not a anti-cannabis, cannabis thing, it's just this is not the right spot. Four sides of it don't want it, 150 other people don't want it. Um, we're not sure the implications of the traffic yet, who burden. Who bears the burden if we need a right-hand turn lane to go in there? I was at a meeting here six, eight months ago. I think if we put a right-hand turn lane in Denny for some reason, and it, I think the cost is two million dollars. Who bears that? You know, where, where does that fall? I know the other thing. Right, thank you, sir. Thank Good morning, Commissioner. State Obvious of the City. Um, I live on Marshall Ranch Road, one foot from the proposed uh, rezoning uh, parcels. And um, I would like to point, uh, ask you a pointed question. Have you been able to read all the materials that we have presented, both to the new materials since we discussed this last January, and the materials that we provided to the board, which was a lot more discovery. As, as we go along, we have learned an awful lot more information on this project. So I hope, if, if I can, answer, uh, get the question answered if you've seen all those materials that were um, uh, online. It's a packet about this thick. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, um, as again, uh, there is uh, uh, a great opposition in the community of Douglas City to this project, and it is now up to 195, really over 200 signatures uh, in the local D.C. area alone. I'm not even going to talk about the, the rest of the county. Um, what we don't believe the, that this environmental constraints support the proposed new zoning project request. We don't believe the traffic report presented tonight addresses the major concerns the boss sent back to the planning department for further study regarding Marshall Ranch Road improvement requirements, which were not discussed nor Highway 3 turn lane requirements in the proposed project and rezone request. That now, for the first time, lists three instead of one parcel on Marshall Ranch Road. 
We don't believe the traffic report accurately reflects the needs and in turn, in turn future needs for the required turn lane update on Highway 3. This turn lane and Marshall Ranch Road improvements would cost the county millions of dollars. We don't believe that taking away property from current Marshall Ranch Road residents to meet Cal Fire Road requirements is justified, nor the millions of dollars it would cost the county taxpayers to do it. Since Marshall Ranch Road is a loop, the entire road would have to be improved because both entrances <coughs> are used by the business clients. We don't believe that soil contamination issue described by the boss has been resolved. These parcels were reportedly also owned by the same logging company with contamination issues described in the planning report itself, yet not inspected because they were owned by someone else at the time. Of inspection, why? Deed restrictions were placed on this property, but not the mine's property. Proposed sites, why? We don't believe the odor issue as described by the boss has been properly addressed either, nor to the extent they proposed. What has not openly been discussed is the fact that the distribution center can take whole plants from the growers, dry, process, and package them on site. More than just prepackaged products clean in the jar. We don't believe that the lack of owner's due diligence for discovery before investing in any real estate venture, especially concerning community input, water capabilities, septic limitations, and soil contamination constraints warrants the community suffering economic loss in improving these deficiencies for them. We don't believe this project, proposed project, will not injure the public health and welfare of our entire community, nor will it improve our economic benefit. No taxes directly to the community, no county. Little to no housing is available in our community, so employees will be living in other districts or counties. Employment opportunities are left wanting now in this county. Plenty of jobs are available. Our county, so much so, we have to hire from a pool of resi uh, residents outside the county. We don't believe a school bus stop located across from highway less than 150 feet from the proposed project site should be moved just to accommodate the, pro the proposed project. Um, alone, have our children trans uh, let alone have our children transiting to and from that bus stop with the project site between the homes and the bus stop. We don't believe our residents' neighbors are any less deserving than the children in recreational areas, parks, etc. They later, later live there 24 7. Thank you. Thank you. Veronica Kelly Albies, Douglas City. Well, here we are again, as he said. Um, three minutes is a pretty short time. Um, we've been here before. I, my comments included links to all of the past as well as other information that has come along since we last joined each other in meetings. Um, and we presented to you and to the staff pages and pages of documentation with corrected information along with public concern against this project. So let's add the new errors. Um, the original project stated that he would have a maximum of 20 employees, not 10, which would then trigger the need for a, an additional bathroom, which would trigger the need for additional septic. That has not been looked at, or there's not even a suggestion by the planning staff to, um, they're going to have to add it, which should be there. The bus stop is within 300 feet of project parcel. The photo is there. Current staff report gives an in-depth report on parcels adjacent and says that they couldn't find the environmental constraint filing. I have given you a copy of the filing. It is in that packet. Um, in the last six months alone, our neighborhood has been subjected to a gaseous cloud. Again, photos in your packet. Consistent noise of engines and or machinery, increased traffic on Marshall Ranch Road, and increased public access from the parcels. They walk up and down. We've had people walk up and down the, the Marshall Ranch Road. And let's not forget, now all of a sudden we have Marshall Ranch Road attached to three of these parcels. And that is a residential neighborhood. Um, they, it looks like an auto repair, but I don't know for sure. But that's what all of the noise and commercial act, what appears to be commercial activity <coughs> looks like. These parcels have been in use commercially for many, 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 many years. There was no one that needed to come along and save them. There is still potential for these as highway commercial. Um, 
And the violations that occur right now, at least in the last six months that I can document, have occurred after 5 p.m. Who do we call? Well, I found out. We call, and it goes nowhere. There is no enforcement in, with it. Um, Mr. Mines has said at many public me meetings that we have tested this water well multiple times and given the results to planning. The only well test on file was from 2014. They purchased it, or they, they deeded in June of 2017. Um, rezoning is not a right by law. Let's use his argument, which he does use, that this is, for some reason, a right by law, and this is a land use issue. Land use and zoning ordinances are developed and created through thoughtful planning for the health, safety, and general welfare of the public. These have had commercial use. They did not sit unused. They have been subjected to real and serious environmental issues that, need, that continue to be overlooked. Um, the current Douglas City Plan supports our claims that this is incompatible. And until the new general plan is created, the public is already letting you know that they feel that this is incompatible with the Douglas City Plan and the characteristics of our community. Um, there's more things in there in that packet that I hope you will read, because three minutes for three really large things is not enough time. So we appreciate you. Thank you very much. Paul Hooser, I, I live on Rush Creek Drive, but I have a first grade daughter that, attend, that uh, attends Douglas City Elementary School. I'm actually not on the petition, but would love to sign it if added names. It seems, I, I strongly concur with your original recommendation or your original finding that not to rezone the property, but seems this meeting is about getting public comment on the record. And I just have to concur that this is in no way a compatible site for this industrial process. If the facility were to be built, the inevitable odor problems, there would be no way to mitigate them other than neighbors having to leave the area. Thanks. Uh, John Brower from Junction City. Uh, I actually have a question. Are we, are you taking comment on both the rezone and the CUP together right now or just the rezone? The rezone CUP and the med mitigated NAIC deck. Oh. <clears throat> then, um, just a few thoughts. Uh, the, the surrounding community seems strongly against the project, as as it appears in this project description, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, the entire county does desperately need uh, commercial cannabis distribution, not just one in Hayfork, but many. <laughs> distribution facilities in the county. We've got at least four or five thousand commercial grows in the county, 300 current permittees. Um, there's an obvious benefit to the county to permit more distribution. Um, the, the site is perfectly situated for transportation and warehousing. Uh, it seems to me that many of the concerns are about the rezone. Uh, encouraging uh, very intensive uses in, in heavy commercial C3. And um, I just want to lobby for compromise, I think. Perhaps the applicant uh, could uh, rezone to uh, C2 instead of C3 or industrial. Perhaps uh, there could be a compromise for uh, one parcel uh, uh, is rezoned to uh, industrial, the rest are uh, remain highway commercial, something like that. Um, odor can be very well mitigated with uh, carbon filters and other technology. Um, it would be tragic to uh, lose this potential location for this use. Um, and it seems like uh, there could be ways to make it more palatable to uh, the surrounding neighbors. Um, uh, with that said, um, I would encourage um, the commission to uh, try to find or encourage some sort of compromise to make something like this work. Thank you.
is Miranda Medine, and I own a home with my husband, Jed Medine, on Marshall Ranch Road behind the pro proposed project. I would like to discuss the use comparisons that have been drawn between HC and C3 zoning and both the general supporting arguments and the environmental initial study analyses. The comparisons include HC allowable businesses such as restaurants and motels that lead to the conclusion that the proposed rezone will have the same, if not a reduced impact on the environment. I feel that these comparisons are misleading as a topic of whether or not the parcels are currently appropriately zoned for HC usage have not been discussed. When the rezone from HC to C3 of the Amerigas parcel to the south took place in 1989, supporting arguments included the finding that the parcel was unsuitable for most uses allowed under the existing zoning due to poor soils for sewage disposal systems. In regard to the parcels currently being considered for the rezone, there are indications that a similar situation exists. <coughs> the original septic installation form for the CUP parcel states that the septic is approved for one toilet and one hand sink only, <coughs> emphasis on only, and that any other usage will require soil excavation and expansion of the field. The county has repeatedly stated that the septic has been deemed adequate, but on what grounds has the septic been, been deemed adequate for the proposed usage of up to 10 full-time and up to 10 additional seasonal employees. Approaching the rezone for the current parcel should follow the same methodology used in the Amerigas rezone. <coughs> Potential effects on the environment should be analyzed based on the current and historical uses for the parcels and how that usage will change with the rezone and CUP, instead of a comparison based on imaginary scenarios such as a restaurant that could never be supported by conditions present on the parcels. There are many additional issues, issues that have been brought up regarding the incompatibility of the proposed usage and the ability of the land to support those uses. One of these issues includes first-hand witness testimony, testimonies that the current water source has repeatedly run dry historically, which contradicts with the well production test from 2014, which is more of a snapshot in time. The response to these issues seems to have overwhelm overwhelmingly been to delay the issues past the responsibility or proposed band-aid fixes, such as the use of bottled water or hauling wastewater discharge off-site. Band-aid fixes are okay for emergency situations, but we shouldn't be willingly walking into a situation where they are expected and have them become a part of the business plan. When rezoning parcels, it should be determined whether the circumstances present in the land can adequately support the end purpose of the rezone. A cannabis distribution center should be a long-term establishment that provides a safe and adequate environment for its employees. I personally believe this can be accomplished by placing a distribution center in an area with municipal water and sewage services and in a less rural location in closer proximity to responding law enforcement. Anyone else? <coughs> Steve wrote us to uh, respect your Mr. Fraser's comment of not to reiterate uh, the things that have already been spoken of, you know, specific to security and safety and water and odor and traffic and bus stop. I just want to say I don't think it's an appropriate location either. Thank you. Gene Goodyear. Um, you know, we have right now somewhere north of 5,000 grows in Trinity County, of which we're only going to permit 500. So we've got a big problem. And um, in meeting and trying to figure out this problem, one of the things that keeps coming up is the fact that um, we don't have an updated general plan. That's a big issue. We can't, we can't, we're having a hard time dealing with what we have going on right now, all the illegal grows and all the destruction. Um, you know, our family's been here for, you know, we've been contributing to this county and community for 100 years. And I've seen a lot of people like the Eaglesons earlier come, <clears throat> build a retirement home, and again, leave because of what's been going on. And to zone this, rezone this property for this use when we have all these issues of water. And I fully agree it should be in a municipal, municipal water, municipal sewer, and uh, the whole nine yards. Um, I just can't see 
how you can possibly approve something like this in a residential neighborhood with so much opposition. Are you? <coughs> Hello, I'm uh, Jed Medin. I live right next to the property that they're trying to rezone. Uh, we're kind of worried about uh, taking four of just the of just nine highway uh, commercial zone parcels away from our core business area, set forth as essential in supporting our core industry, recreation and tourism, and turning them into heavy commercial industrial zones. Uh, these rezones would forever change the entire character of our community, creating a huge industrial park along our scenic highway, and destroy the adjacent neighborhood, which I'm part of, uh, and those surrounding it from higher elevations. We don't believe Mr. Mines wishes to create a distribution center, but as he has stated, too many, and in written form and in prior rezone applications, that in the near future he wishes to start up manufacturing and cultivation on these sites. We do believe we have updated our community plan with over 195 Douglas City residents signing petitions against the proposed mines project. From all sides of our community, including growers and non-growers, we believe this growing industry deserves a place in our county, but this is not the right spot. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Dickerson from Douglas City. Not to be too redundant, but just uh, I'm hopeful that the commission uh, votes to turn this down and not rezone it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Fred D'Antoni from Douglas <coughs> City. Um, I am against cannabis. But having said that, the law allows it to happen. We are required to follow the law, just as you are. We're required by the zoning codes and everything else. We've heard lots tonight about mitigation, how that's the way to make this process work. Mitigation is not only licensing, but includes denial and refusal to grant a variance and or grant a rezone. Just because an applicant wants one of the above, we don't have to do it just to make them happy. We have also heard that compliance is gained through mitigation, but as you as commissioners also need to remember that the compliance is gained through enforcement, as well as following the existing rules and laws and codes that regarding the requested rezone. In short, the decision to rezone or not should not and need not be granted just because an applicant or, or appellant does not like the answer they've been given previously. It's like a petulant child who wants his way and keeps stomping his feet until he gets his way. I'm a parent. We didn't do that in my house. We didn't do it in the house I grew up in. I'm hoping you don't do that tonight. Because there is no reason to rezone unless you want to allow that or encourage that behavior, I strongly hope that you do not allow the rezone and we continue along the path you seem to have gone before tonight. Um, as far as starting this and allowing this process to continue, you've opened Pandora's box at that point. The smells, the contaminants, whatever they may be, have gone at that point. You can't go back and correct those. Yet you allow it if you allow the rezone. Pandora's box is open, the damage is done, the bad living conditions done. Maybe it goes away because you then stop it, but it's already happened. <coughs> 
And so, again, I'll, I'd encourage you to not uh, allow that. Thank you. from a Fork. Um, you know, I think I drive by this place all the time. And while it's zoned HC, um, I think that the totality of all the you know comments suggest that that's not even appropriate zone for this location. And I think that if the idea that a restaurant won't be able to be served there, or a hotel won't be able to reasonably be served there, then probably should be rezoned. I mean, that's really where the logic goes. If HC is not appropriate, maybe it should be rezoned. And C3 would probably be appropriate. I would have looked at C2. I think the neighbors want it to be open space, but they haven't said that. So I think that this parcel, if these parcels are actually going to become productive, that probably should be rezoned. I mean, that's the way they're underserved currently. And the water resources suggest that, you know, an HC zoning is probably not appropriate, actually. So the propane um, facility is HC, uh, I'm sorry, H, uh, C3, right? And across the street is industrial. So it's not as if this is an incompatible use of the neighborhood, in my opinion. Um, as far as actually putting a distribution center in there, it's a great spot because it's close to Highway 3 and 299. So it's in the center of the county for distribution. And I think the idea of moving it to Hay Fork, the suggestion being that there's people coming to this county that are going to set up big operations, which is what I just heard. You guys are from the East Coast. That is outside interest coming in, big money. I thought that's what we were trying to work against in this county. Um, I would also go ahead and mention that the odor complaints, I mean, distribution, it has to be prepackaged when it comes there. It doesn't have a processing license, so they're going to be... The odor is probably overstated. And my concern with the odor mitigations in here is that said code enforcement will take care of it. Well, if there's a complaint, how is actually that complaint verified? I don't think we have a good methodology in this county for identifying odor complaints. If you read the draft EIR, they want an expert in our county who's, you know, can has the ability to detect different aromas and verify the location it's coming from in a particular compound, which is of course not possible, really. So there's really not a good way to, to deal with that situation, I'll be honest. Because then it leads to a situation where a neighbor can complain without any actually evidence, and the way to resolve that's not clear. So I think that that's a problematic way of approaching odor. Um, page 17 of the staff report also talks about the um, license, the CUP being available for one year. I have no idea why planning staff keeps adding this, but in a CUP, you're allowed two years. But for cannabis, I like to just make it one, which is hard to deal with, with the way licensing is to get your uh, county and state license. I think they need two years as allowed by Trinity County Code. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Scott Morris. I'm here to stand in solidarity with the folks who signed the petition in Douglas City. Now, sadly, our county has been hoisted upon by unfunded mandates by the California Initiative process that says we will legalize marijuana and you will have marijuana. And we are the ones who are having to uh, bear that burden in Trinity County. And we look at the number of grows that we have here, the number of illegal grows. Justin refers to people coming from out of the area. Uh, one has to be blind not to see the license plates that we here have here from all over the United States to grow marijuana. Uh, and I think a very small percentage of um, our legal marijuana, uh, we, that percentage stays here in the state. I think we are growing for the rest of the nation. Um, and I really appreciate the hard work that you guys do because you're the bulwark. You're our protection. You're the ones who are helping us who are non-growers who want to live in our neighborhoods without the impact of cannabis. And that's a hard position to be in. 
and we need your help, and we appreciate that help when we can get it. Sadly, this has uh, sucked the um, creative oxygen out of Trinity County, but all we are focused on, most of our conversations are around cannabis, and we've become a monoculture economy, just as we did with timber and other economies in this county. And we need to be able to move beyond this and to look at other economic opportunities in this county. If we only focus on cannabis, we're going to be left where we were with timber and gold and other resources to extrication. Thank you. Thank you. Cross. I own the industrial property across the street from the B property and uh, started off I'm not against development. I would like to see the development stage in some way that would help the community and maybe that would help out some of the problems that we're seeing with the neighbors and stuff. Um, including water, one of the primary ones. Water is a big issue in all of the county. Good drinking water good water for irrigation or for other uses. Uh, another one is the traffic. Right now the traffic is excellent, fine right through that section, no complaints. Um, hopefully this doesn't involve causing a, a, a change in that, making it more complicated, you know, to the point where we have a boulevard stop like think, or something. Anyway, uh, so I worry about that coming up in the future. But if we can direct the development in this area of the county to what it helps all the people involved and not maybe one person or one parcel, that might be the best way to mitigate your work, what's going on in the county and in this parcel. By the way, thank you for your reports. Uh, this is that uh, report was quite interesting and enjoyed reading. kind of important to realize whether people want to admit it or not, the cannabis industry has been holding up this county economically for decades now. Um, and I think now with, with this legalization, we have the opportunity to contribute to this economy in more meaningful ways, right? Thus far, it's been through ancillary businesses, providing people the means to put food on their table and, and shoes on their kids' feet, right? But now in these more meaningful ways, we can contribute to the school systems, the roads, law enforcement, all of these things, right? And, and all, all of us cultivators up here, we are, in the grand scheme of things, we're small farms, and that's because of the limitations that's been put on the cultivation area during the lawmaking and vetting of this cannabis program. And because of that, the large distribution companies do not care about us. They do not care about us at all because they can go right down the street to these large cultivation operations, and it's much easier for them. You know, it's just, like, we, we do not matter at all. Um, and the sustainability and economic viability of this industry and thus this economy, they depend on projects like these ones where it's local people who care about their community, right? It's not, I think there's a misconception here. It's like I, I hear all this stuff about legal grows and illegal grows and like the people who are trying to do this through the licensure, licensure process, we don't want, all of these things that are giving us a bad name, we don't want them around either. And it's not because we don't like being called bad names, it's because we don't like them in our community. You know, it's like we're we're all on the same page here. I mean, it's not, you know, <laughs> I, I'm a young person, right? I want to live in a place where I know that I have economic security and that's a safe place for me to build and grow a family. These are things that I want, okay? And I think that every, pretty much everybody sitting in this room is probably feeling the same way. Um, and I think that the, the crux of this issue seems to have fallen on the rezoning, right? Because 
all of the other things seem to be, the, the CP seems to be satisfied all of the requirements for that, right? And the zoning now is not necessarily like a, a, a law or a right, correct? Um, and, it's, and it's of the opinion. So I, I think that um, basing these decisions on a fear of something that isn't actually going to happen, like there's not Marshall Ranch Road, right? Nobody's going to be entering this place from Marshall, Marshall Ranch Road. It's all coming from Highway 2. That's, that's almost an irrelevant thing, right? Like, yeah, sure, maybe that could happen, but honestly, that's not the case. Come on, guys, let's wait, let's leave, let's leave a little common sense here. Um, we need this. We need this as, as small farmers, and that's everybody here. Even these, these large places down south, they dwarf even the two one-acre parcels, the little biggest ones, right? They dwarf those ones. And so, like, we, we need somebody who cares about us. And we care about this community, too. You know, it's like, it's not, this isn't a one-sided thing. You know, we're not trying to extract all this money. We're here so that, like, we can inject some, some income into this community and into this economy so that it's a better place for everybody. You know, it's not, it's not just all about this. And I, I think that stalling, stalling projects like these and we need more than more than just one or two up here. We need a bunch to make this actually work. And I think stalling projects like these is very short-sighted, and I think it's very irresponsible to all of your constituents, okay? And it's like, people need to be able to make a living here. Retirement checks are not going to allow for people to make a living here. We need a real economy. We need a real economy. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> Seeing none, we bring it back to the commission. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, <they're working laughs> Go ahead. <coughs> I believe children are one of our greatest assets. It's our responsibility as adults to protect and provide healthy environments that are safe. Neighborhoods with stable families are one of our greatest assets. It's what's made Weaverville great in the past. Please remember those that are too small to speak for themselves. Money's not everything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last call. Anyone else? Seeing none again, we'll bring it back to the commission. Commissioners, any thoughts, questions, comments? <clears throat> this property is actually the ideal location for a distribution facility. As was said by Mr. Hawkins, it is located on Highway 3, right near 299. It's accessible from all areas of the county. Another distribution facility besides the <coughs> one in Hayford is essential. It's something that is really necessary. It doesn't do any good if we license growers and they have no place to move their, no way to move their crop. Um, I cannot stress enough how much this is needed. Any other comments? I think we observed last January the wishes of the community expressed in their community plan. Um, this is part of the Douglas City Core District. It's highway commercial. It's four lots. Uh, have I forgotten to count now? Nine? Nine. Four lots, so it's almost half of the highway commercial along the highway there. Um, the update, is, uh, the, the signatures were characterized as an update to the community plan, and there's certainly some validity to that. But we're, what we're about to embark, I hope, soon on the general plan update, which will include community plan updates. 
And we're hearing from the Douglas City community, the surrounding community right where this is, about how they want to see this part of the area develop. I don't, none of that's changed since we reviewed this in January and reached a conclusion that it's not an appropriate rezone at this site. I'm open to having distribution in an appropriate spot. It just strikes me that nothing's changed since January and this remains the wrong spot. I can't, I cannot see any of most of the usual highway commercial industries being able to build or be in that area because of, of the problems that, that are there. This is, this is something that fits that area. Um, I understand that it's zoned highway commercial. I'm not sure it should remain, as some one of the members of the public said, I am not sure it should remain highway commercial. I'm not sure if it remains highway commercial. It will ever look any different than it does right this minute. which doesn't put us in the position that we ought to preemptively take it out of highway commercial. It's not until, preemptively. We're following the procedures to do so. No, we're preempting the wishes of the community oh. to a very large extent by, by taking the action. So I don't support it. If I may. Mr. Chairman, I do definitely agree with uh, Commissioner Stewart. A uh, distribution facility is needed. Um, it is a big part of the puzzle. And in order for the cannabis community that's um, making the most, of the most effort to comply with county and state legislature, it is definitely, it's, it's an important part of the puzzle. And yes, the site is adequate. It, it's, it's a great physical location intersecting Highway 3. Uh, it's a wide turn in. Um, uh, however, there's just certain inherent issues with this parcel that just makes it difficult to approve. Um, and, and one of my concerns is also in where we should not speculate on future uses, but by rezoning this, Mr. Mines, like other people have, and I'm not saying he's going to do this, could potentially sell this to for a type seven manufacturing facility or who knows what other proposed use this could take place. And then we, we must consider that as well, like, you know, by rezoning this for these properties, what, what could potentially take place. Um, that, that is definitely a concern. I, I, I don't see the need, and we, we stated this before earlier in the last year, I don't see the need that why we need to rezone four parcels when only one will be used for the dis 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 distribution facility. And um, then in fact, that would I, I, I am opposed to rezoning all four parcels because that would just, again, the, the properties could be split off, sold, and then all this access to Marshall Road um, would essentially be a commercial access. And then that, that's troublesome for the neighborhood immediately adjacent to the, these parcels. So. That's, if that's, you'll recall last year, I suggested on the rezoning one, one parcel that was my motion and nobody else. Furthermore, I'm sorry, and, and septic de definitely does need to look into uh, by OSHA standards. Uh, for every 15 employees, you need two restrooms. I mean, to have like a half path, uh, the septic system is completely inadequate. And the new percolation test or a revamp or the entire system would need to take place if this uh, rezone or if the conditional use permit is approved. issue I have with supporting it is not necessarily the project itself but the fact that by rezoning which 
it said in our staff report we're supposed to consider the project. Um, I do believe that we also have to consider the other permissible uses of C3 zoning. If we rezone this, that property can be sold and any other heavy commercial use can move into that. Um, and I don't think that that's something we should open up the core area of Douglas City to. I think uh, there is a reason that their community plan wants it to be highway commercial. Whether those highway commercial businesses are viable in the future, <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. Um, the, the thing is, I don't think that we should open that up to heavy commercial use, with, especially without the support of the surrounding community. With that said, would anybody care to make a motion Sorry, um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I do have one more comment. Okay, uh, and, and this, and I, I meant to bring this up at Mr. Davidian's uh, CUP that we addressed last year, and I noticed that this is also in this conditional use permit, on condition 13, uh, number 13 says, use per, uh, failure to permittee to make use of this use permit within one year or failure to comply essentially nulls the permit the uh, ordinance, uh, county ordinance, stipulates two years. So um, I, I just want to make that note. And uh, from now on, I, I'm not opposed of a more stringent condition, but um, the reasons for that stringent condition needs to be applied if, if that's going to be stated. So that's to make a motion. Are you looking for a motion on uh, everything? Oh, on everything. The CEQA, the, uh, and the, so, well, we've had one public comment. We've heard a comment on all, we've heard environmental issues, we've heard rezone issues, and we've heard issues regarding with distribution. So we have public comment on all three. Yes. Do you want three motions? Or, or, or uh, there is a resolution. You do have a resolution. We do. We have a resolution to approve. You do have a resolution to approve. I'm sorry. We're going to go the other way. Do you want three motions or not? Uh, no. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I would. I would. Enlighten us here. Yeah, it kind of matters on what direction you're going. If there is a resolution um, available to you that includes um, all three components of the project and that reflects staff's recommendation um, of recommending approval on those three items. So, um, Again, it kind of depends on, on what you're doing and just as a hypothetical, if you were to um, recommend to the Board of Supervisors to approve and certify the initial study and mitigated negative declaration being consistent with CEQA and adopting that, you can do that. Um, if you were to say, however, you're recommending to the Board of Supervisors that the parcels 08, 09, 10, and 11 be um, not rezoned or if you're then parcel eight gets rezoned to HC3, um, and the other three remain as they are, however you want to do that, but you do need to go through the, the resolution has them stated here on page two, and so you're gonna to want to go through and do them individually, or as a part of a giant motion, however you want to do that. Um, okay. But you do need to address all three subjects, because they're all part of the project, and that makes it clear, and gives, again, if it's a denial, we need to have a specific reason why it's being denied, not just a black denial. Okay. So, would you, are you prepared to make a motion or three motions? All right, I'll take a shot. All right. I move. We recommend to the Board of Supervisors that they not approve the mitigated negative declaration 
that they not rezone the four parcels and they not approve the conditional use permit, finding that the mitigated negative declaration doesn't adequately address the issues raised of um, traffic and water, and that the rezone is inconsistent with the community plan, the Douglas City community plan, um, as refreshed by new input from the community, the, the community plan being dated. So the new input from the community reflecting an update intent of the community plan and that the condition use permit is be denied because highway commercial is not an appropriate zone for distribution. Does so anyone we have a motion? Anyone care to second that motion? I'll second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion or <coughs> Motions. Hearing none, we will, I guess, once again, in the spirit of tonight, have a roll call vote. Thank you, Commissioner Stewart. Nay. setbacks for any new at least residential structures if not other structures as well and um, I, I think we will have to address many of our since I took a trip through title 17 today many of our sections don't have anything close to that in our residential setback section so I'm curious to understand how we will apply that and try and be consistent with it, since it's in Title 24 with the new state code for building it. So I'm guessing this is more of a comment. I don't expect anything to answer, but at some point we are going to have to figure out how we factor that into the zoning board. Yes, uh, uh, fire, uh, state's fire safety regulations um, uh, were updated and went into effect January 1st. Uh, there's some big changes in those, and one of those being um, uh, originally in the state response areas for parcels over one acre in size. Kim, I don't mean to cut you off, but this is not an agendized item. I think it's appropriate for you to ask for to report back that on the next one but it's probably not appropriate for us to have a yeah, discussion about it. Yeah, I don't prefer to answer it. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> All right. Any other but, uh, concerns, questions from commissioners? Um, I have a question what, uh, concerning February 13th meeting. Do we have a full docket? What are we... Are we looking at, do, do you have a, any idea what we're looking at for February? I do not. Um, Bella, do you have any ideas coming up for February 13th? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, 
actually, um, uh, okay, so looking ahead to the calendar for February and March, um, I, I will be at a conference March 14th um, and will not be available. I'd very much like to be at the inclusion of the regular scheduled meeting. Uh, so one thought is to reschedule February's meeting to February 27th. Uh, we may have a, a fairly large project ready to go for February 27th. Um, but this time, I, I do not have any project on the docket, so to speak, um, for February 13th. Okay. Um, what would be required for us to do that? If just the fact that this could be noticed in the in the paper, and then you'll that we're not going to have the meeting in the 13th and move it to the second scheduled meeting. Uh, uh, as, as we, uh, it's, and, you know, make sure confirm this is the case. I will be in touch with you. Potential for those options, but um, I need to confirm first. We don't have any items needed to go on February 13th. I don't believe we do. Okay. But I need to confirm that. Yeah, I I do have kind of a scheduling conflict that day. It would be the only reason I'm interested. All right. So moving on. Planning staff. Oh yeah, um, that. Um, sorry, I'm a little shell shocked, and I don't have much to report for. Uh, at this point, um, there is a lot going on. <laughs> um, I don't know where to start, but um, you know, the staff's working really hard. We're trying to keep things moving forward. Um, the subdivision review committee is a, is a big topic. As I said uh, earlier, we do have several parcel maps and the tentative subdivision maps that are, are backed up, uh, even with our consultants. Uh, there's stuff we need to do in-house, and we don't, we're working as hard as we can. But that is a, a very uh, important um, issue is the subdivision review committee back on track and involved in the beginning of the process. So do you have anything to talk about? Just work a lot. Yes. Uh, and just to confirm, there's no January 23rd meeting. There's no second meeting this month. No. That would have had to be noticed so there would be no January 23rd. And, and uh, someday I will come back with the bylaws so we get those cleaned up and, and not have that second meeting in the month that we have to consider each. So as of right now, the next potential meeting is the 13th. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to push it to the 27th, if you can. If we can, um, uh, then we wouldn't. Um, need to have the meeting in early March and or February 13th, so that would be the ideal, um, having a meeting February 27th, possibly. Uh, I mean, for my situation, it would possibly for the chair, so and that is how it works for everybody. Well, for my schedule, I could do either day. Not that anything else is down here. <laughs> All right, anything else? No, nothing else. All right, then we will adjourn. We didn't.